This is Dr. Tuckman. I'm going to be speaking about a coronoid fracture ORIF using the medial over-the-top approach. We have a few choices for medial approaches to the coronoid. We have the over-the-top approach, also known as a Hotchkiss approach, which we're going to be speaking about today, which is between the flexor carpi ulnaris and the palmaris longus. We have the FCU split, which is split between the two heads of the FCU. I had made a video on this prior, uh, fixing an anteromedial facet fracture of the coronoid. Then we have the Taylor Sham approach, which is a subperiosteal elevation uh, from the subcutaneous border of the ulna anteriorly. Uh, this is an approach I really don't have any experience with. Patient is a 42-year-old male who fell from a ladder. X-rays demonstrate an isolated type 2 coronoid fracture. CAT scan with 3D reconstructions demonstrates a type 2 or type 3 coronoid fracture. If you look at the center picture, there appears to be posterior subluxation of the ulna in relation to the distal humerus. The incision is placed approximately 2 centimeters volar to the medial epicondyle and extended distally in line with the ulna. You do want to watch carefully for the branches of the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve. The incision in the flexor pronator mass can be started on the supracondylar ridge and then taken distally between the FCU and the palmaris. You do have the option of starting at the medial epicondyle and just going distally between palmaris and FCU. I do find it a little bit easier. Uh, if you're not as comfortable in this area to start on the supracondylar ridge, it makes your initial dissection a little bit easier. The interval between the flexor carpi ulnaris and the, and the palmaris can be sometimes challenging to find. The flexor carpi ulnaris tends to be more uh, tendinous in this area, palmaris, a little more muscular, so you can find that interval. And if there's any question, just take your muscle split a little bit more posteriorly than a little bit more anteriorly. I do find it easier to start the dissection on the supracondylar ridge, which is on the left of the screen. Bring the dissection over the anterior aspect of the distal humerus. You then drop into the joint, and from there you can take the dissection distally. Here the flexor pronator mass is being elevated. Capsule can be visualized. Right there is the synovium. The trochlea can be visualized. The dissection is then taken distally. You can elevate some of the anterior capsule to help your exposure. The dissection is taken onto the coronoid. The retractor is continually repositioned. Brachialis can be visualized, coming in inserting just distal to the coronoid. A portion of the brachialis can be elevated. The coronoid can then, is then visualized. Anterior capsule is released a little bit, and the dissection is taken subperiosteally on the coronoid, elevating a little bit of the brachialis. The dissection is then taken posteriorly. Portion of the MCL can be elevated but does not need to be elevated. The plate can be placed on the MCL. Subparalysal dissection is then performed on the ulna as well as on the fracture. Dissection is taken distal for plate placement. Subperiosteal dissection is then taken radially on the coronoid. The extent of the comminution can be visualized. Fracture pattern is assessed. Fracture reduction can be achieved with some simple manipulation of the fragments. Temporary fixation with K-wires is not typically necessary. The plate usually reduces the fracture.
the plate is then applied and appropriate fracture reduction and plate placement is assessed. The determination is made the plate needs a little bit of contouring. The plate is then contoured using the plate benders. The plate is then reapplied. The appropriate reduction of the fracture, appropriate placement of the plate is then confirmed. You do want to make sure the plate is sitting on the ulnar shaft distally. The screw is placed in the oblong hole. Visual inspection of the fracture reduction and plate placement is then performed. The elbow is placed to a range of motion. You do want to make sure that that most ulnar screw hole is not in the joint. Fluoroscopy is used to assess fracture reduction and plate placement. The remaining screw holes are then filled. The screw holes up on the top of the flange going across the coronoid do not typically have to be filled entirely. Uh, it can be hard to uh, avoid the joint with these screw holes and this plate is mostly a buttress plate on the coronoid. Fracture reduction and plate placement is then assessed. The elbow is placed to a full range of motion to make sure there's no block to motion. X-rays show appropriate position of the plate as well as appropriate reduction of the fracture. There's one screw that looks like it's going to the joint. You can see on the lateral that screw is posterior to the joint. It is important to perform an external rotation view to confirm that none of the screws are going into the proximal radio ulnar joint. Fascial split is closed with ovicral sutures, taking care not to injure the ulnar nerve. Skin is closed with interrupted buried sub-Q, 3O monocryl sutures, dermabond, and steristrips. Patient is placed in a soft dressing, no splint. They are encouraged to perform a home exercise program of full active range of motion. Sling is worn for approximately three to four weeks. At week one, begin a formal physical therapy program with full active motion. Add in passive range of motion and resistive exercise at six weeks and full activity between two and three months. X-rays at six weeks post-op demonstrate the fracture is healed. Thank you for watching this video. I encourage you to leave comments and let me know what you think.